Uh, guten Tag, or good morning, everyone. So my name is Sylvain Cloutier. I'm from ETS in Montreal, so I'll be the moderator for this morning's session. Um, and uh, it will be my pleasure to be the uh, timekeeper. So uh, the, the talks are 15 minutes. Uh, I, I was told by the organizers that we can allow one or two extra minutes without uh, any uh, shut down, abrupt shut down of the speech, but my job is to make sure to, I'm the lunch keeper, so to make sure that we keep on track. So about 15 to 17 minutes for the talk and then about uh, three to five minutes for questions. So we have a, a great array of speakers uh, this morning. Uh, so our first speaker is Mr. Steve Statler from Willio. So I had to go online if, to see if it was Will IoT, Will IoT, or Will IO, but I, I saw it, it's clearly Will IO. So uh, he, he will be entertaining us with a very uh, exciting topic about amb ambient IoT, so scaling from billions to trillions, saving supply chains and the planet. So uh, Mr. Steller, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, it's a real pleasure to to be with you. Um, how many people here remember what it was like before the internet? Raise of hands. It's obviously a lot of very young people here, so. Um, okay, those of you that remember the early days of the internet, how many of you bought the modem and got online and, okay, few few hands here. So diehards, diehards, early adopters for sure. You kind of expect that at, uh, at TechBlick. But um, it, it wasn't easy. Uh, it, often you had to buy a floppy disk, remember those, and load a, uh, some TCP IP software. And then you were dealing with Gopher and Telnet and FTP. And if you are lucky, you got one of those mosaic browsers where you could actually see images. That stage of the internet is really where I believe the internet of things is today. The internet of things started with, like a lot of things in technology, with a lot of fanfare, a lot of excitement, um, but it really hasn't delivered on the promise of being the internet of every single thing. The good news is I feel like we really are on the brink of doing that, um, and you know, because I'm in marketing. Uh, we like to give new names to things. So we're calling this next generation, Internet of Things, the next generation, the ambient Internet of Things. So I'll explain a bit about that. It's not just a marketing term. It's a set of standards. Uh, and there's some real uh, interesting applications that I think will make a huge difference to people, both in terms of wealth uh, and, and also probably more importantly, the, the, the future of the planet. So before I get into that, I should explain a bit about where I come from. Uh, I work at a company called Williot, and uh, it was founded by the original developers of the millimeter wave technology, which is one of the reasons why 5G is faster than 4G if you're in the right place at the right time. Um, we are um, venture funded. Uh, companies like Amazon and Verizon and so forth, Qualcomm are investors. Um, and we've pioneered the development of a postage stamp compute device. I actually carry my product catalog around with me in my wallet, uh, which is something that I've never been able to do before. But this is basically um, an ARM processor with RAM, ROM, flash memory. It's uh, actually an active radio. Um, it's got three antenna loops, you can see on the diagram. Two of them harvest energy. We harvest Bluetooth energy and sub-gigahertz energy. Uh, and so it's battery free. Um, it's got three cores. It communicates over Bluetooth. It can sense temperature. Uh, and our goal is for these to sell in volume for less than 10 cents um, next year. So we this year, we'll probably make about 150 million of them. Uh, and those are generally being used in the early stages of deployment on, on what we consider to be the ambient Internet of Things. So ambient IoT is really just an evolution of the computing paradigm that we've been living with for some time. It started off 
commercially with mainframes. They cost millions of dollars. They were the size of a building, and there was probably a few thousand of them. Then following that, the price came down, and we had desktop computers, and we went from thousands of those to millions of them. And now all of us are walking around with a compute device that rivals the mainframe in our pocket. Uh, it costs uh, hundreds of dollars, and therefore there's uh, a small number of billion of those devices. So we think that with the price coming down to less than 10 cents, we can see a really significant increase in volume, um, and that this will make a big difference to a number of things. Uh, at the heart of it, there needs to be an ROI. So uh, there's huge opportunities. If you turn the lights on, if you think of us running our businesses that center around supply chains, where we really don't have a lot of visibility of what is where, inventory, again, it occasionally gets scanned. But most of the world we deal with is offline. It's like we're running our businesses in the dark. We've got some battery powered flashlights, we turn them on, and we get a, a snapshot of the state of things. If we have uh, the lights on, uh, and to use a gaming metaphor, if we activate God mode and suddenly you can see the whole map in real time, we can get a lot smarter. Our supply chains can become not just a little bit more efficient, but much more efficient. And that efficiency and a few other things uh, we feel is going to be key to the fight against climate change. That photograph was taken a few hundred yards away from my back door. I moved to San Diego from England, um, and within a few weeks, the whole place was on fire. So climate change is uh, quite meaningful to me. Um, the other opportunity is to fight a hidden tax, which is crime. Uh, you, you go to most stores, Certainly in the United States, things are increasingly locked up. Um, and um, you go further afield, and there's an epidemic of counterfeit goods. So having a digital ID that can be read and tracked end-to-end uh, -end can make a huge difference. And we're seeing that in our early deployments, where uh, we put these tags on the reusable containers that the post office uh, has um, uh, Sorry, not the post office. I was just noticing that the timer here is not moving, so I'm kind of, if you could activate it, then that will uh, allow me to keep on track. Um, we found that when you start tracking reusable containers, um, things that can go missing uh, uh, in large amounts. Uh, one uh, British retailer was losing 60% of the reusable totes they did home deliveries to. They started putting, um, uh, internet devices on them, ours, uh, it went down to single digits because suddenly people knew where the things were. So what do we mean by ambient? There's a Merriam-Webster definition surrounding us, all around us. But really, the Internet of Things is a progression from the Internet of expensive things to the Internet of ordinary things like food, clothing, medicine. These are the things that we engage with every day. And we believe that battery-free technology, uh, very low-cost connectivity is the key to that. And it will change us from this paradigm I was talking about, where we have scanners, optical scanners, RFID scanners, that are actually frequently handheld devices that cost $1,000. Uh, and we'll move to a paradigm where it's the commodity radios that are everywhere in our fridges, in our pockets, that become the readers, and that allows us to see a supply chain continuously. Now, I'm not disparaging RFID. A lot of, well, all of uh, these IoT pixels are made by companies that have been in the RFID business, and they swap out one chip for another. Um, so. RFID blazed the trail in terms of uh, Internet of Things, uh, but we have a chance to reinvent it with something that was born with the cloud in mind um, that can generate real-time triggers that can allow us to change the way we handle goods uh, and deliver medical treatment uh, that can sense not just temperature but humidity and light that has end-to-end -end security and uses existing infrastructure. The Bluetooth SIG, Says, says this market, 
the addressable market for ambient IoT is going to go from IoT at the moment, which is less than 50 billion devices, to 10 trillion devices. So that's the scale of change that we can look forward to. And I believe with just this blue tech Bluetooth technology, we can get to hundreds of billions of ordinary things that are online, but to go further, it's going to require more standards. At the moment, we are a firmware upgrade away from your smart speaker, your, if you have a smart doorbell or a smart camera, from those energizing these tags and reading them. But who's going to have access to that data? It will be whoever manufactured the smart speaker and those other smart devices. We really need the kind of standards and functionality that the carriers have, the, wi uh, the wireless carriers with roaming and data sharing, in order for this connectivity to scale and for everyone to have access to, uh, to that. So what we're seeing is active work in 3GPP on something called Release 19 and is formerly the ambient IoT feature. We're seeing work in IEEE on 802.11 AMP. Uh, and the Bluetooth SIG uh, is seeing this progress and not resting on their laurels. The, we currently use the, the basic Bluetooth standard that's used everywhere, um, but there's more that can be done to help this ecosystem scale. This is what our deployment of ambient IoT looks like. There will be many. Hopefully, there will be many more from many other companies. So we have the tags. And in case there isn't uh, a ready supply of uh, energy that we can harvest, you can fill in the gaps with devices that don't cost thousands of dollars. They cost tens of dollars. They're basic, simple Bluetooth devices. They talk to gateways, which can be Wi-Fi access points. And those, in turn, relay the stream of data that is being pushed constantly uh, to the cloud. And our business model is we sell cloud services, we design the chips that go in there, and we license those to third parties that can make the tags. We don't make money from tags or edge devices. We're actually a, a SaaS company. So what does this look like? Uh, one of our customers is one of the world's largest retailers. They're under huge pressure from uh, online uh, players to get more efficient. And so they're putting these on cases of product and seeing things that have never been seen before. This may seem a little trivial, but this is detergent, a case of detergent, and the way it moves around the store when it's been delivered uh, to a store that it shouldn't have been delivered to. So there's a lot of dysfunction that we have no idea about. We don't know it's going on, but we suddenly see it when everyday products go online. Uh, and in this case, the product's moving around because there's no shelf space. So it moves backwards and forwards. That's taking time. That costs money. Uh, it's inefficient. Um, but we're also seeing things on their way from distribution centers to stores. So um, in this case, I think we're talking about bananas, but we've seen cases of strawberries that get frozen not once, but six times between a distribution center and a store. That wasn't on anyone's radar before. Now it is, and we can do something about it which will increase the shelf life and improve the flavor of the products that we buy. So how will we access this data? A lot of it will be through enterprise applications. Um, but this is a experiment that my group within williot has been working on, something called Living Web. It's a browser for the physical world. So this will actually end up working with regular QR codes, not just with, uh, with our pixels. Uh, but it associates a digital passport, which in this case has been populated with temperature history and a carbon footprint for the product that can be browsed um, on someone's phone. So this is an iOS app, and it can hear the things that are around it. It can see the digital passport, and it can remember the history of that product. Uh, so you know where it's come from. Uh, you can, t If it's a, uh, um, uh, some produce, you can understand whether it came from a regenerative farm or not. So 
we think that this is going to be a huge driver of profits. Bus new businesses will come to life. Old businesses will disappear. Um, but the most important thing about this is what it can do uh, with respect to the climate crisis. Hopefully, you have a sense of how waste reduction can be achieved uh, if you can track where things are. But we can also re-engineer supply chains, turn them into demand chains. If we have manufacturers that are able to see their products throughout the supply chain, and even in homes, then they can make less, but we can make sure that people don't run out. Um, and the whole thing can be more efficient. And we can move to a paradigm where the carbon footprint of companies is calculated every day at a product basis, and everyone in the company has the data they need to improve the carbon footprint of their organization every day. So carbon is cost. We believe this will be the signature of well-run companies in the future. So that was a brief tour of what we're doing with Ambient IoT. It really is a, a new category uh, 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 that is hopefully breathing life into an old idea of the Internet of Things. I think the benefits are huge. And I think the skills and capabilities of this community have direct relevance to, to, to this. There's a, a lot of uh, scope for printed electronics and the innovation that is being um, embodied by people in this room. So uh, I hope you'll get involved in Ambient IoT too. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. So we have time for a few questions. Yes? a mechanism by which, uh, or a business model by which these tax can be brought back into life rather than just shredded and, and, and uh, you know, thrown away? Yeah, it's a good question. It's one that we've been working on. Um, uh, and it's one that the RFID industry has been working on for some, some years. The, you know, the negative side of this is we're introducing electronics into new categories of products where there were not electronics before. And this is a little bit like the argument around solar panels and electric cars. Um, yes, you know, great technology, but technology itself has a, has a carbon footprint. We believe that the savings um, that can come from connecting the internet and artificial intelligence to everyday things will vastly outweigh the negative side of that. But it is important that we are able to recycle this. And um, actually, the next conversation I'm going to have once I step off this stage is uh, with a colleague uh, where we're working on um, a, a research application to help with the kind of materials that will allow the separation of tags in the recycling uh, process. Um, so that um, um, it's, it's less about recycling the silicon in the chip, because the chips are tiny. Uh, it's more about not putting a spanner in the works for the recycling process for the cardboard and the clothing that it's attached to. Um, another question? Well, maybe I have one. If, uh, well, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, lifetime issues, I mean, and the environment conditions that this... Uh, your 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 chip was uh, can sustain and uh, so can you put it outside? Can you? Uh, yeah, that's it? a good question. So it is battery free, so that gives us a head start. Um, we did a project for one of the largest makers of COVID vaccine, and we integrated this with the vaccine vials. This particular type of vaccine was temperature sensitive, and so we found that we were able to produce a tag that could be cryogenically frozen, defrosted, and it would still work. So um, that gives you a sense of the level of resilience. This can be uh, a paper tag, um, but it can be made from more resilient materials, and it can actually be put in an injection mold and uh, be super resilient in that case. Another question? If not, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you so much. Thank you.